Welcome back you guys. In this video we're going to be looking at these examples where we will see energy changes and work done. Uh, I've listed work by non-conservative forces. We'll also see how work by conservative forces would, uh, would also affect our situations. A couple of these examples come directly from this section in the chapter, but uh, one does not. And so make sure that you're paying attention, taking quality notes, right? As I'm sure you guys always do. Here, the first example is uh, we have this situation where there's this person on a diving board. And please laugh all you want at my person. Person has stepped off taller torso here. Person just kind of stepping off of the end of the diving board. So we have this initial position. I'm going to mark that initial position here. And the diving board is some distance above the water line. And we're going to call this H, this distance above the water line where this person begins. After falling into the water, this person will sink beneath the surface some distance. And you have to forgive me, my drawing is not going to be to scale. But we have this new final position for the person, and here's a distance D beneath the water line. We're allowed to set our origin, our, our zero line, a reference line, anywhere we like. And so what I'm going to do is actually put this origin here at the water line. So go for origin, label this the positive x direction. And there we go. Now, we need some information about this person. Um, we have a mass of 95 kilograms, and, and they step off of the diving board. There's no jump, no running, and they drop into the water three meters below. So we know that H is three meters. The diver comes to rest some distance D beneath the surface of the water. If the we're, we're going to be given an amount of non-conservative work. If the amount of non-conservative work done is negative 5,120 joules, then we're asked the question, what is the depth to which this person, uh, where, where this person comes to rest? So the depth, that or that distance D underneath the surface, is our goal. That is what we want to find. Okay, so here's the setup, and... Recall that non-conservative work is, is work done by a non-conservative force. Essentially, as the person is, is moving through the water, they are slowing down. It's much like friction. It, you might call it drag with the water. There, there's the water flowing around them, and it's just like drag through the air for an object moving through the atmosphere. It's removing energy from the system and slowing this person down. Eventually, they'll come to rest at this new lower level. So now, the first step we want to do is evaluate the initial and final conditions of energy, now specifically of mechanical energy. And mechanical energy is just capital E. And this is what we're going to be doing first. So our initial energy, our initial mechanical energy, it comes about from an initial potential energy plus an initial kinetic energy. It turns out that the initial potential energy is simply due to this person's height above our origin. So we have an MGH. And the initial kinetic energy here 
is simply going to be zero. This person steps off of the diving board. There's no initial velocity. So that's very straightforward in this case. And so just the total mechanical energy is simply mgh. What about, uh, initially I should say, what about the final condition for this mechanical energy? Well, we have a final potential plus a final kinetic. And so we can look at those. Now the final potential, this guy, look at what's going on here. This person has uh, moved through the water this distance d, and that distance d is actually in the negative direction, so we have to put this minus sign in there. mg times negative d. Something else that's kind of cool for us is that, well, at the end of things, this person is not moving. Again, there's no kinetic energy in the final condition. So we're just adding zero. And therefore, the total final mechanical energy is something m times g times the opposite of that distance traveled through the water. Now, this relationship that we want to use right here is that the work done by non-conservative forces is going to be equal to a change in the total mechanical energy. Well, what we know about that, any delta, any change, is a final minus an initial. So there, there was a reason for evaluating our initial and final conditions and understanding what they are and where they come from. Because we're going to look at that difference. That difference will tell us the amount of non-conservative work done. Or conversely, since we know the amount of non-conservative work done, this can tell us something about one of these parts. Specifically, the question we're asked is for this distance d. And we see that distance d showing up here. And so what we need to do is simply expand these two terms in, in the relationship, and we'll, uh, we'll start to see this. Essentially, the non-conservative work now I look at my final mechanical energy. I've got, I'll just bring the minus sign out front. I have negative m g times d. And I'm going to subtract my initial value of mechanical energy, which is m g h. And so what I can see is my unknown. My unknown is showing up nicely in the equation. That's my goal right there. Always, as soon as I can see it, I need to ask myself, do I have enough information to, to start to solve for it? I'm given the non-conservative work. I'm given the mass. G is a constant. I'm given H. Bingo. We can look at this and, and get it done. I want to solve for distance D. I want to isolate that. So that's what I'm going to look at here. Solve for D. When I do this, it turns out I'm going to see that I still have a minus sign in the formula here. I have non-conservative work plus MGH divided by MG. And here's my formula. Now, why this minus sign? Well, what you notice is what we're given is the work done by the non-conservative force is a negative value and that's kind of handy so what's going to happen is we're going to have the minus signs essentially cancel out and we'll be uh, realizing this distance d is a positive distance even though we know that this person is traveling in the negative direction that's fine we just want the distance or depth under the water so we can substitute some values and solve and we're going to get our answer just fine. 5,120 joules is the non-conservative work. Ah, negative. Sorry about that. And the mass is, ah, the mass is not M anymore. The mass is 95 kilograms times G, 9.81, and times 3. The height is 3. Okay. And the mass is 95 kilograms down below, and 9.81. And so you get two three sig figs, 2.49 meters.
Awesome. No, I, I was a little lazy. I understand you're all going to get on my case about sig figs. I had two and two. Well, okay. But in reality, when you read this section and you go through this example that actually comes from the textbook, you'll see they gave these values in three sig figs, and you'll see the answer in three sig figs. There you go. So what happened here? The water was doing non-conservative work. Okay. The person was moving in the downward direction and they were slowing down so their acceleration had to be in the upward direction so the net force had to be in the upward direction. But not only that, the work slowing them down was also in the upward direction, opposing their motion. This is, this is essentially friction with the water is, is how you can think of it. So we see this negative value because if you think back to what work is at its most basic level, it's force times distance times the cosine of the angle between the force and the distance. And so the angle is going to be 180. You get this minus sign popping out because of that, and everything matches. Next example we're going to look at. This one also happens to come from the textbook. We see we have this uh, tabletop. On this tabletop, we have this mass. Call this M1. And M1 is attached to a string. String is going to go around a pulley. String goes down to M2. And initially, M2 is resting some level above the floor. So I'm going to draw the arrows like this. Instead of inside, it would disappear inside. Same idea. What we have, though, is an initial position here. That's an I for initial, sorry. And an initial position here for this block. These are connected objects, of course. But also, when the situation uh, comes to what you might think of as an equilibrium state, M2 is going to end up falling down through this distance, which means M1 is going to slide to the right through an equivalent distance, right? That distance there. Now, in terms of energies, we're going to be looking at more than just these distances and more than just velocities there are energies related to position. So we have two blocks. They're connected as shown here. We have uh, some values. M1 is going to be equal to 2.40 kilograms. There's your three sig figs for you. M2 is going to be equal to 1.8 kilograms. 1.0. I'll try to stay consistent for you with this problem. When they're released, M2 will fall through this distance D. Let's actually let's label that distance D. Here's distance D. All right. What I'm going to do this time with my origin is I will set the floor level to be the origin. And so if I have be consistent here with the coloring. I have a vertical axis. And what I can say is that on this vertical axis, well, there's there's some height for block one, but obviously as block one slides, that height will not change. There's also some uh, an initial height for block two. That's actually distance d above the origin, isn't it? Okay. As these blocks slide through distance d they're going to continue to do that until block two hits the floor. So there's more, a little bit more knowledge here. In, in this situation, we're going to see non-conservative work being done because there is friction right in there. OK. And if, there, if that's taking place, what we're going to look at is, uh, in this situation, if we know the coefficient of kinetic friction to be 0.450. And there are no units, it's a coefficient. 
we're going to be asked to find the speed of the blocks just before mass 2 hits the floor. So we're looking for this final velocity. That is our goal. Okay. Just like before, we need to evaluate initial conditions. It can be very helpful, actually both initial and final conditions, it can be very helpful to do this for, for any problem you're facing. Initial and final. Here we go. Initial and final mechanical energy. That's really what we're looking at. By the way, time out for a second on this problem. When you guys are faced with any problem, you're sitting down for a test, and particularly the AP exam, right? Unless you're told to try to solve this problem a certain way, using certain skills, then you're free to use any skills at your disposal, any knowledge, any relationships. Quite often, using these relationships with energy and work will be easier and faster for you than trying to do this through the equations of motion, the equations of motion, the kinematics business. Those are still available to you. Might slow you down a little bit. So here we go, back to the problem. We're going to evaluate initial mechanical energy. And we have two objects. Yes, they are connected, but there are two objects. We need to account for initial energy of both objects the initial energy comes in the form of both kinetic and potential energy, so we have to account for all of those things. We're going to have an initial from block one and an initial from block two. I'm just going to call those initial and initial. They are different. Uh, maybe I could have a one and a two. There we go. We're also going to have a kinetic initial from one and a kinetic initial from two. Okay, now something interesting happening there's there's we we know i've already mentioned look at this mass one block one as it slides the height is not going to change its initial potential energy is not going to be changing okay so i i can make a little mental note about this in this stage so the initial potential energy of block one Seems like it won't change as that block slides. So my brain is going to kind of just pose this question whether I want it to or not. It's going to ask, well, uh, does that mean that this initial of object one, this initial potential energy of object one, well, there we go, a little better, will cancel out? I don't know. I'm suspecting we're going to find out. But I can uh, I can expand this a little bit and say to myself, well, give myself a little more to work with. This initial is going to be m1 times g times h. That's how high it is above my origin. Okay. I'm going to add the potential energy for block two initially. This is going to be m2 times gravity, times g, times distance d above the origin. The nice thing here, when I get to the kinetic energies, nothing is moving at first. It's, it's at rest, and then it's released. So those two terms go to zero. No problem. Don't even have to write them down. Now I want to evaluate the final energy conditions here. And just a, a general statement I can make is oop, that final for two plus kinetic final for one, plus kinetic final for two. Okay. And I can expand each of those. Again, give myself more to work with. The, uh, the final potential energy of object one, its height hasn't changed. It's still M1 G H. This is what I'm talking about. The amount here to here from initial to final did not change. How about potential energy in the final position for object two? Turns out it's going to have zero. It will be on the floor, zero height above the floor. So that goes to zero. Right as it hits, right when it hits, it, both these blocks are moving. 
kinetic energy is one half m1 times final velocity squared and this kinetic energy is one half m2 times final velocity squared. Okay. Now there's an important thing to realize, something very important happening here. This final velocity and this final velocity. They are the same. These are connected objects. They will be traveling at the same velocity, accelerating at the same rate. So I really just have one variable in two locations here. Okay, I'll come back to that idea in just a moment. We have evaluated the initial and final um, in energy levels in, in, in various places, the potential plus the kinetic. So, now what? Well, recall that work done by non-conservative forces is going to equal a change in that total mechanical energy. And that's going to be equal to the final minus the initial amounts of this mechanical energy. Also, recall that the work done by non-conservative forces, in fact, the work done by any forces, is going to be a, uh, in this case, a due to friction. Recall that there, we're saying, well, there is friction. This is a real life situation. So friction is the force. Well, we've got a force times a distance times a cosine of theta. The force is kinetic friction. And this is interesting. Now, with friction, it opposes motion. It's in the opposite direction. So it's 180 degrees away. So cosine of 180 gives us a negative 1. So we're going to be able to get rid of this cosine theta in just a moment. But something I know about friction forces. Let me put this over here. I know that friction, especially kinetic friction, well, specifically kinetic friction, is equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force. Well, how about this? What about that normal force? When you look at this situation, this is a horizontal surface. The normal force is simply going to be equal to the object's weight pushing down, which is going to be m1 times g. So I can rewrite normal force as m1g. And that means I can rewrite uh, kinetic friction as mu kinetic m1g. And then, therefore, this business goes into this spot in our equation for the work done by non-conservative forces. So we're linking a bunch of stuff together. And I have this, this is essentially all this business right here. This whole bit is simply that force. Now I also must multiply by the distance. Cosine of 180 is negative 1, so I'll put a minus sign out front. And that handles that. I get to get rid of the cosine, one, uh, cosine theta in that spot. Cool. Well, no, well, I simply am able to say, I, I've worked this out as far as I can, and I'm in good shape. So I can equate this business to this business. And I've already evaluated and, and broken those down. So here's how this works. Coefficient of kinetic friction times m1 times g times the distance traveled. And here's an equal sign, and I look at this difference here. Final minus initial mechanical energies. And I've got those each broken down for me already. It's kind of handy to have done this. So my final energy is, looks like it's going to be three terms. I have M1 G times H plus one half M1 Vs squared plus one half and two V of squared. And that really, if you think about it, that's just all my final conditions. My initial conditions were a little simpler. My initial conditions were simply M1GH plus M2GD. 
I'm going to have to try to squeeze this in. I wrote a little too large. But remember, I'm taking away my initial mechanical energy values. So I have to take away M1GH. And I also have to take away, sorry about this, take away M2GD. This is just one equation kind of running onto a second line here. And I'll, I'll rearrange this. I'll rewrite this to squeeze it in over here. Keep in mind, what I'm staring at is these final velocities are the same. It is one value that I can find. So there's a little bit of um, uh, kind of combining and simplifying that's going to happen. But, but beyond that, there's even more. Check this out. I see that there's an M1GH and a minus M1GH. How cool is that, that those are totally canceling out? Stuff is simplifying already. So, quick rewrite. Let's make sure I'm not losing track of anything. Coefficient of kinetic friction. M1 G D equals, and that went away, I have 1 half M1 V final squared plus 1 half M2 V final squared. That went away, and so I have minus M2 G D. Okay. When you get this deep into uh, an equation or a problem, it's often handy to always go back and say to yourself, what is the goal? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a reminder. Aha, I'm looking for that final velocity. So I'm going to want to isolate final velocity here. Essentially combining terms, factoring something out, and trying to work all this through. At this point, that's exactly what I have to do. So when I work through this, I'm going to start by saying to myself, oh, OK, I can factor out a 1 half VF squared from these two guys. And that leaves me with M1 plus M2. And I'm subtracting M2 GD. And that equals all this business on this on the left side. To try to further isolate final velocity, of course, I'm going to have to add m2 gd to both sides. And then I'm going to have to divide by 1 half, and I'm going to have to divide by the sum of m1 plus m2. Then I'm going to have to.